so uh, there's the mother and she's downstairs and she hears her seven-year-old boy screaming loud and she runs upstairs and says what is it what is it and he find, she finds the two-year-old has a big handful of the seven-year-old's hair in her hand and she's just pulling as hard as she can and so she extracts the hair from the hand and uh, and and the boy is steamed he's very upset and she tries to calm him down and says listen you know she's just two she doesn't understand she doesn't know how that feels she she's just a little girl please let her alone let her let her free let her you know forgive her and so the mom leaves and the next thing she hears is the two-year-old screaming and she runs back and she says what happened he said she knows now Sometimes when people are set up in a situation where rivalry should occur, they let rivalry occur, and things can get ugly. And that's exactly the account that we hear of David and Jonathan in 1 Samuel chapter 18. After David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. Now, here's the problem that we have. We do not live in a hereditary monarchy. And so it all seems a little distant to us, right? A hereditary monarchy is really different. When, when they said Jonathan is the king's eldest son, everybody who lives in a hereditary monarchy knows exactly what that means. He is the crown prince. He is the next king. Uh, we see this playing out over in England, you know, <laughs> and people keep saying, won't he please abdicate, please abdicate. His son would make a better king. I mean, you've heard all this stuff, right? And so this, this concept of a crown prince is a little bit distant to us, but it wasn't distant to the people who saw this happening and who read the story for the next 2,000 years. But who was this Jonathan fellow? You know, we talk about David, and we're here to talk about and learn about David, but who was Jonathan? The story goes back to chapter 13 and 14, and we learn a lot about Jonathan and his character. So Jonathan is, is the young guy. He's the crown prince. The, the king, Saul, has just really messed things up. He went ahead and did a sacrifice that only Samuel should have done, et cetera, et cetera. And then we get to the place where Saul is down to 600 troops against the whole Philistine army. But here's where it gets even worse. He's got these 600 troops, and the rest of the army has fled. Now, where did they go? We find out in the chapter that, in fact, a bunch of the army has defected to the Philistines, and they're fighting as mercenaries for the other side. We find that a whole bunch of the army is just hiding in the hills of Ephraim. They're just hiding. They're gone. They've evaporated into the countryside. And poor Saul is left there with 600 troops, and he is super frustrated, and he's a really bad leader. Because with his 600 troops, they're just camped around a pomegranate tree, it says, and they're just waiting to see what will happen. Everybody's out there ready for war, and he's doing nothing. And then it tells us this amazing thing. It says that there were no blacksmiths operating in Israel. Why do they tell us that in the middle of the story? Well, it's really interesting. Either the Philistines have come in and killed all the blacksmiths, or they've simply outlawed it. Now, we didn't have that picture as we read this story. We had a picture of two sides fighting from different places. But clearly, this is a picture of the Philistines having a kind of an occupational authority over the Israelites. And these poor Israelites, they can't blacksmith anything. They have to take their, their farm implements to the Philistines to get them sharp, sharpened. And so there are no blacksmiths left. And so picture the battle. It says in the scripture that only Jonathan and Saul had swords. The whole rest of the army is, is armed with farm implements, axes and scythes, and other things that aren't really good weapons. 
And so Jonathan is hanging around, and it's clear from the reading the scripture, you guys go home and read 13 and 14 of 1 Samuel, and you'll see. Jonathan is, is sick of it. He's sick of waiting around. And so Jonathan tells his armor bearer, his right-hand guy, who also doesn't have a sword, he says, hey, bring your scythe and come with me. Maybe he has an axe, I don't know. Maybe he has a little machete, we don't know. He says, bring your scythe and come with me. Let's go see what these enemies of God's people are about. And so it says that he climbed down through a canyon where there was an outpost at the top. And he says to his friend, he says, let's do this. Let's test God with a sign. Here's what we'll do. We'll go down there, and if they say, stop, get out of here or we'll kill you, we'll leave. But if we get down there and they say, come up here to fight us, We'll go up and fight them. And then they have a quote that you probably ought to memorize. And the quote says, Nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle, whether he has many warriors or only a few. And so here's Jonathan and his friend. They're going up. Now, by the way, how would you like to live in an occupied country where nobody can be a blacksmith? How would you like to live in an occupied country where certain professions are simply prohibited? You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do the other thing. I have found that people are really, really, really good at adapting to horrible situations. Maybe you've known somebody like this. I, I remember when my, uh, I was in school, my sister used to have a bassoon lesson. Now, believe it or not, people actually give bassoon lessons. But anyway, she had a bassoon lesson and she'd have to go to every week. And it was at this guy's house. He played in the symphony. He was a great bassoonist. We went over to the guy's house. And what, what I didn't realize until afterwards, he was a big friend of cats. And so he used to feed a lot of cats in his backyard lived in an old neighborhood in San Antonio. And the way he would feed the cats is he'd take a paper plate and put a can of cat food on it, and then he'd put that out on the back porch for the cats. And the next day, however much they ate, he would put a new can of cat food on a new paper plate and put it on top of the old cat food on the old paper plate. And there'd be a stack a couple of feet high. Uh, the cats would have to stand on their hind legs to reach the cat food. But what happened was that the cat food underneath on all those other paper plates would rot. Now, I don't like the smell of canned cat food to begin with. But when you let it rot, it becomes a horrendous odor. When I walked into this man's house the first time to go to, with my sister to her lesson, I honestly thought that I would not be able to hold my stomach. I started to kind of choke and I choked through the entire lesson. I thought, this guy lives in this house all day long. And he plays the bassoon, so he's sucking in air all day. And I thought, this is ridiculous. But, you know, people can, can adapt to horrible situations. There are people in this church right now. There are people who have chronic pain. Back pain, ear pain, shoulder pain, knee pain. They're people that have bone-on-bone -bone joints. And they have pain all the time. But you never know it because they adapt. There are people all around us who, have, who live in situations where they're being abused by their spouses or their children or their parents. And we don't know. People are amazing in their ability to adapt to different things that none of us, if it came upon us all at once, would ever tolerate. And the children of Israel had adapted to living in an occupation in a terrible way. And even when the army came out for battle, Saul never took them in. He just let them camp around the tree, and it got worse, and it worse. And you know, sometimes we like to complain about our first world problems, right? This week I had a doctor's appointment, and I had to wait for over an hour. I was almost late for my next appointment. 
And I'm thinking, but I have health insurance? And the doctor helped me? And it was all good? But, you know, for a while there, I just thought, I'm not going to put up with this. We are so uh, sensitive to issues. You know, you've been there. You have a poor cell signal. And you go, why can't they fix this? Poor cell signal. We didn't have a cell signal when I was just a little bit younger. <laughs> I, I love the one that I got upset about the other day. I came home from the grocery store and there wasn't enough room in the refrigerator. Now, what kind of person complains about that? It's insanity, isn't it? And so we have these first world problems. First world problems it's funny to think about but the Israelites had real problems they had real problems that needed to be addressed and redressed right away but Saul was not doing his job so Jonathan and his friend go down there and they get to the the canyon and the Philistines call down to them and they say oh we see that the we see that the Israelites have come out of their hiding holes. Why don't you come up here and we'll teach you a lesson? And that was Jonathan's sign from God. There was time to go up. And it, the scripture says an interesting thing. It says they climbed up the cliff with their hands and their feet. In other words, they made themselves extremely vulnerable to have to, if, can you imagine climbing up to the place where the army is waiting for you to teach you a lesson and you, your hands and your feet climbing a cliff? I mean, they could lop your head off as soon as you get there. But God honored Jonathan's faith and there were 20 fellows at the top. And it says that Jonathan stood one way and his armor bearer stood the other way with apparently an axe or a sickle or something. And Jonathan fought from the front and the armor bearer fought from the back. And when they were done, there were 20 bodies on the ground and Jonathan and his armor bearer were just fine. At this point, the entire Philistine army hears that they have been defeated by two young men. And the scripture says that the entire Philistine army began melting away. That's the word it uses. They started melting away. And Saul saw it happen. His, his, his spies, his watches, his lookouts all saw it happen. And he still couldn't make a decision. He says, well, what should we do now? What should we do now? At this point, all of the mercenaries that are fighting for the Philistines turn against the Philistines. All the guys that are hiding in the hills see them evaporating, and they jump into the fray. And finally, Saul brings his 600 troops into the fray, and it's an absolute victory for the children of Israel because Jonathan had the courage to say, God can win with few or many. Let's go try it. So this is Jonathan. He's the crown prince. He is ready to be the king because the king is not doing a very good job. And Jonathan would have done a much, much better job. But what's really interesting is that it comes to this place. And in this place, our friend David is having a conversation with Jonathan's father. And Jonathan watches this conversation and something important happens because when he's having this conversation, all of a sudden, Jonathan's heart is transformed. And Jonathan says, my, oh my, this is one great guy. This guy, this guy David, he's a guy that I want to be with. And it gets worse. Because it says, then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took the robe that was on him and gave it to David. Interesting. With his armor, even his sword, and his bow, and his belt. You remember another story like this? comes from the book of Esther chapter 6. Remember what happened? 
The king can't sleep, and so he reads in the books that Mordecai has done him a good deed. He has stopped uh, uh, an assassination attempt. And he thinks, man, did we do anything? And he asks, did we, did we reward him for saving my life? And, uh, and the servant says, no, you never did anything for him. And he says, who's that out there? And it's Haman. And he says, Haman, come in here. And he says, Haman, what, what, what should I do for somebody I'm really excited and I want to give a blessing to? What should I do? And Haman, thinking it's about him, he says, here's what I would do if I were you. I would take your royal kingly robes and I would place them on this person, put him on your own horse, and have someone of high stature running around in front saying, this is what happens to people who do a good turn for the king. King for a day, if you really want to know what it is. King for a day. If you're on the king's horse and you have the king's robe, you're king for a day. He says, that's what I'd do for somebody if I wanted to really honor them. And so he says, great, do that for Mordecai. Just like you said. And of course, he got to be king for a day. These robes of the crown prince are his indicia of being the crown prince. And when he gives them to David, guess what happens? It's tantamount to an abdication. Just like everybody talks about over in England. That that prince, the crown prince, that he should abdicate. And that's exactly what Jonathan does. But what's really interesting is that Jonathan, Jonathan would have been a good king. Jonathan was courageous. He was faithful to God. He did great things. In fact, after he won that battle, his dad had made some promise that nobody should eat anything, and and Jonathan had eaten a little honey, and, and, and Jonathan even said, Dad, that was a really stupid thing you did. You shouldn't have said that. But he had made an oath that he would surely kill the person who ate. And so he should have killed Jonathan, but... The people saved Jonathan. That's how much they loved him. This is a perfect opportunity for a perfect rivalry. Jonathan versus David. Why was there no rivalry? Because David's spirit and his heart were like the heart of God. And Jonathan in his faith could see that. Now we go back and we say, why? The answer is that David is a type of Jesus. And when people read the scripture and they really learn about Jesus, we cannot help but love that man. In the same way that Jonathan, who could have been a big rival of David, could not help but love David because he saw God's spirit working in him. And we see God's spirit working in in Jesus and we cannot help but love him I've told you before that I have a little exercise that I sometimes do when I get confused and I don't know about you I don't really actually hear voices in my head just as a kind of a general rule I'm just wanting you to know that um, they call that schizophrenic but I don't I don't hear voices in my head but sometimes it gets loud in my head. You know what I'm saying? You've got so many things you're thinking about, so many things you're trying to make a decision about, and, and those, those, those voices get a little loud in there. And I've told you what I do. I, I imagine that inside of my head is the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. And I sit in the captain's chair, and I look around the bridge, and I see whose voices I'm listening to. You know, we all have voices that we hear, right? Our, your third grade teacher, some, somebody from KES maybe, I don't know. You, you hear, uh, I, know, I know my wife, you know, she hears Max Barton. So we, we have these voices that we hear. My parents are always there on the bridge, even though one of them has passed. And, and so you, you look around the bridge. I, this is what I do. I look around the bridge. And I make sure at that point to kind of in my mind, in a, in a kind of a ritual sort of uh, imaginary way, in my little metaphor, I throw everybody off the bridge whose voices I don't want to hear right now. So I throw out 
the third grade teacher who was a little bit of a racist, and I throw out these other people who, whose voices are not helpful to me at this time. And then I got to make sure that on my bridge that Jesus is there, right? I got to make sure that Jesus is there. And Jesus usually stands over there where Spock used to stand, right, at the science station. And, and so I listen. And I think about the scripture and I think, what would Jesus do? And then I do exactly what Jonathan did. I get up out of the captain's chair in my little mental imagination I get up out of the captain's chair and I invite Jesus to sit in the captain's chair and in my little imagination I then kneel down and I bow before him and I say not my will but yours be my captain and here is Jonathan who was the crown prince, the heir apparent, the guy who would be king. And with no good reason to do so, he gives up his right to be king because he meets the true king. And the question is, are we going to retain our right to make our decisions and to be our own king? Or can we bow down and give the right to kingship in our life to Jesus? You can't do it just once. Because when I return to the bridge, there's always a whole crowd up there again. There's a whole crowd and I'm sitting in the chair and everything is reverted to normal and I have to go through the whole imaginary process again. Now you may think I'm crazy, but I think it's crazy to try to continue to negotiate the life that God created us for without Jesus sitting on the throne. And so I invite you, if you have an imagination that's as strange as mine, I invite you to try the exercise. Maybe yours isn't the Starship Enterprise. Maybe yours is Horatio Hornblower. Maybe yours is some other fictional image that you have. But at some point, we have to physically take off the royal robes that we're inheriting and say, I want you to lead me. I don't want to keep trying to make my own path. And Jonathan gives us that perfect example. And so today, simple, you know what I'm going to ask you to do. As I pray, I'm going to ask you to turn your heart back over to Jesus. Without reservation, give him the chair, give him the robes, Give him anything that might leave you in charge and let him be in charge of your life. May I pray for you, Heavenly Father, right now. We ask that you would allow us to abdicate our throne. We give you our weapons, we give you our robes, we give you our desires and our victories and our failures and our families and our cars and our homes our fears and we ask you to manage these for us we bow down before you and we trust you even if the path that you choose for us is uncomfortable we ask you to forgive us of our sins and to carry us forward to your kingdom and nowhere else. Please give us your spirit today. Let us be Jesus to others in whose name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.